So great to see everybody this morning. So glad you all are here. It's such a beautiful day outside. Glad you all are here. So this uh, next song uh, we're going to be doing is a new song called Love as One. It's one I wrote um, based upon 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, John 17. So I hope you guys enjoy it and we'll sing along. Let's stand, see what it's all about. Please be seated. You guys can be seated. We're glad you guys are with us in our time of worship. Colt, you did a wonderful job. I think that chorus is something we can kind of sing this entire year. This, you know, we need to sing that a lot. I appreciate you and your creativity. God's gifted Colt a great way to be able to lead us in worship and uh, not only just being able to perform, but also to write music, and it's always great. And, uh, hey, we're glad you're here in our time of worship. You see, we got a rose over here. This rose represents when we've had a new birth to our church family. And I've been informed by Leanne, we're going to have like six new roses 
Moses over the course of these next couple months. And uh, this one right here is Abigail Ruth Hodges. She's born to Justin and Katie Hodges, and we're excited for that family. Big sister is Ellie Mae and uh, granddaughter of Jim and Fran Osmond. Kind of help you make that connection there. But as you get to see the Hodges and uh, let them know that we love on them, here's what uh, Leanne does. She'll take this rose, and she kind of has a little gift packet that she takes from the preschool ministry to that church family this week and just let them know that we're uh, encouraging them. We want to be behind them, especially as they uh, beginning a new journey with uh, going from uh, just the, uh, now they're one-on-one. It's, uh, you, you know, uh, that defense of, uh, I don't know what that's like. i got to play zone in my ha- house, so that's all great. Hey, I want to let you know about another family that's joined our church. It's a new uh, church uh, member. This is Chris and Amanda Fletcher. Chris and Amanda come from a sister church, and they got uh, Gordon and Ansley was with them, but uh, Chris and, uh, uh, and Amanda both were very involved in college ministry, very involved in their church, but they just felt like this was a place for them, and they're really involved in Dr. Mark Wiggins' Sunday school class, and we're grateful that uh, that class class has been able to make a, a good connection for them. They said they want to make this to be their church, and so we're excited about that. Hey, over these next several weeks, we got a handful of activities that are going to be happening, and so the digital bulletin, our church website, is where you're going to get a lot of great information. We got baby dedication coming up, high school graduation, college graduation, Mother's Day. We're going to be doing church out at the ASU Pavilion in May. You just need to be able to see all those details. Go to our church website. There's the church, the bulletin for it, all the information. That just helps you stay informed about what's going on, and we want you to be plugged in here. Today, we're going to celebrate baptism. We got a testimony video before to watch before we have this baptism. school at Valley View Junior High. We left to come to this church, and I've been having a lot of good times in this church, and I've been thinking a lot more about God, and now I want to get baptized. The reason why I wanted to accept Christ is because as as soon as I started coming into this church, I saw, wow, this church looks really amazing and stuff, and then it not only did it look amazing, but they teach the stuff really well. And so my entire family started studying Christ more, and I started to believe, and so I want to get baptized now. To me, following Christ means, well, accepting Jesus as your Savior, but following through with what He says to the best of your ability, and to just just try to be as like him as you can. I feel like my life will become a lot more positive and I feel like I'll be a lot more be able to be more forgiving and kind and more close with the Lord. And I'm excited to be baptized today. Church body. Well church family it's a blessing whenever the baptismal waters are stirred. Can I get amen? When Bryce Weaver comes here today, Bryce, if your family would, would give us a wave real quick so you can see them. It has been a blessing to get to know Bryce. God has really been, been doing a work um, even before Easter, um, and, and this has come to fruition today. And so it's been a blessing to get to know him and an honor to get to ask you this question now, Bryce. Bryce, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, if you will, by that public (laughs) profession, you got it, you got it. By your public profession of faith, which all these people are overjoyed about, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried to death, raised to new life. I'll pray for us. Such a joy. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing, God, of just doing your work that you've commanded us to go and to make disciples and to baptize them in this way. Father, would you not let this just be a moment of this service, God, but would it motivate us to just a deeper love for you and and action on your word, God? We thank you for this day. We thank you for this family. We thank you for allowing Bryce to join this family, God. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand as we read Psalm 66 and sing afterwards? 
Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. Come and hear all who fear God. And I will tell of what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer, nor his loving kindness from me. From the rising of the sun. From the rising of the sun to the ending of the day one name alone be praised and every nation tribe and tongue all creation Your name 
Lord, we just came off Easter, and we got to look at the story of who you are, what you've done, the price you paid, the resurrection, and conquer, conquering over death, Lord. And so often we just think, oh, well, that was Easter, but Lord, it is the greatest hope, the greatest encouragement we have is that you have conquered death, and now that life can too live in us. 
And Lord, may we grasp it. May we hold on to it. May we seek it daily, knowing that you are our only hope, knowing that your strength and encouragement that comes from the resurrection will be well with our souls, Lord, that you have created us to follow and run after you. Lord, you've created everything to honor and give you glory. Lord, may we too honor and give you glory with our own lives, grasping on to the life that you give us. Lord, I ask that you be with Rodney as he comes, Lord, and I ask that you bless him as he leads us through scripture. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colton, to musicians for leading us in worship. We're so grateful. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Would you please take your Bibles, turn to the 19th Psalm. Psalm 19. I want to begin a sermon series, The Gospel According to the Psalms. And I want to offer a, a quick caveat um, and then maybe some trivia before I launch into the first sermon thinking about the significance of this particular psalm. And the caveat is this, I must confess to you that as a young man, a young Christian, I didn't care for the Psalms. I didn't care for them at all. I didn't see what all of the fuss was about. I often hear older people talk about how much they love them, but in my idealistic self, I saw everything as black and white, right and wrong, and um, confidence and doubt were the polar extremes of my understanding of knowledge. And the thing about the Psalms that I've come to appreciate the older I've gotten is the psalmists basically identify with all humanity by claiming even faith in God, sometimes life gets really messy. And the authenticity, the honesty of these Psalms meant more to me the longer I follow Jesus. And as a matter of fact, for the last year and a half, I've been going through the Psalms just for my own spiritual, spiritual growth and reflection. And it occurred to me last fall, I think I want to preach a message, a series of messages on the gospel according to the Psalms. Now, I know you know the word gospel comes from a Greek word, euangelion, we get a word evangel from it, and it means a good message or good news. And I know for most people, you might think of the gospel in a very narrow sense of like the the four spiritual laws of the Roman road. Indeed, some might even point to the beginning of the gospel. The first word of the gospel is, everyone's a sinner. Well, that's true. But according to the psalmists, the first word of the gospel is not everyone's a sinner. The first word of the good news is, God created everything. And he created you. And you were meant, therefore, to reveal the glory of God in very beautiful and wonderful ways. That's the first word of the gospel. And the psalmist, Psalm 19, starts there as well. And it's basically built on Genesis 1 and 2 and the significance of the Hebrew cosmogony. So I want to talk about the 19th Psalm, but a little, little trivia before we get started. In my study, I traced every reference to the Psalms throughout the New Testament. It took me a while. And as I went through, find every reference to the Psalms throughout the entire New Testament, there were several surprises. One of the biggest surprises is our favorite Psalms, at least a number of our favorite Psalms, don't make it into the New Testament. I mean, the most popular Psalm, which is? Psalm 23, it's not there. New Testament writers don't care for it. That's kind of hard for me to take. And there are other psalms, like, like the 46th Psalm, which becomes so comforting. You know, God is our refuge and strength, not there. 100th Psalm. The first Psalm. I mean, these psalms that are so, and some of my favorite psalms, just if they make it, they only, it's kind of an aside, a, a brief mention to the side. And that that kind of surprised me. And yet when I traced all the places where the New Testament writers quote the Psalms, it also amazed me is which is the most popular psalm. Anybody know the answer to that question? Don't you hate these trivia games? <laughs> well, later you can impress people. Say, Guess which psalm was quoted the most? <laughs> that is, if your pastor's reliable with this. <laughs> huh? No. 
although it, it makes a good showing. I think the 22nd Psalm is like the third most quoted Psalm because my God, my God, and it shows up in the gospel narratives. Anybody? The 110th Psalm. The Lord said to my Lord. That's the most popular Psalm. And the writer who quotes the Psalms the most, anybody want to venture a guess? Yeah, we don't know his name. And I heard you all got a little inside information on that. Yeah, that's okay. That's right. The preacher of this sermon to the Hebrews that we call Letter to the Hebrews, he quotes the Psalms more than anybody else. And Paul comes in second, probably much to Paul's chagrin, because Paul liked the Psalms. As a matter of fact, the Psalms, if you don't count the repetition in the Gospels that tell the same account, they're quoted 64 times. 72 total. And I wanted to th work through the places in the New Testament that seem to anchor the good news of the New Testament writers. So we're going to start with the 19th Psalm, quoted a couple of times. As a matter of fact, Paul is the one who quotes it. We're going to go to Romans 10 towards the end of the sermon. It'll, and believe me, when I get there, it's going to feel like, oh no, he's getting a second wind. It's going to take another 30 minutes. It's not. When I have you go to Romans 10, we'll only have just a few minutes left. But Paul's going to anchor the point for us of what the psalmist is claiming. And I think this is a really important word. It's the first word of the gospel, the general revelation of God. Here it is. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Psalm 19. Their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth. And I'll come back to that Hebrew word in a minute. And their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of the chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It is rising. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The psalmist works with an assumption, and it's very Jewish, that when you greet the day and take in the beauty of creation, you can't help but be overwhelmed with what the art of the artist is saying to you. That's where he begins. Of course, we know God created all things with words, let there be light. And yet, the bedrock of those words, the word of God, creation itself shouts out day after day. He says, pours forth speech. And yet, they don't quite use words. But isn't it true that when you consider creation, does it not speak to you? Does it not inspire you? Do you not hear perhaps even the voice of God when you take in all that he's made? It's an amazing place that he's made, right? And, and so the psalmist basically wants us to start there. And he speaks of the heavens, in Hebrew, the word for heavens is shemayim. So the heavens is ha shemayim. And the ending, yim, is a special ending for Hebrew words that come in pairs, like eyes, ears, hands, feet. Well, the heavens come in pairs. There's the heaven by day, and he talks about the sun moving, coursing through 
the heaven by day. And then there's a heaven by night, sun, moon, and stars shine brilliantly. And then the Jews believed beyond the second heaven is the third heaven where God is. And so all creation is his footstool, looks down upon all creation from his throne. So when he says the heavens are declaring the glory of God, it is the handiwork of creator that speaks loudly to us and invites us to, re- to join creation in its voice, in its glory. And what I love about the psalmist here is he says something similar to what I hear artists say all the time. Whether you're a visual artist or a musical artist or uh, a literary artist, the one thing I've discovered about artists, and I'm not one, but I really admire artistic work, is that they have all kinds of um, messages they're delivering through their art. But you know one thing they'll never do? They'll never tell you the words you were supposed to hear. There are times when I'm captured by a work of art, and I stand before it or I listen to it, and it just keeps speaking to me over and over and over again. And you might even look up the artist and say, now what did you mean by that? And they'll say to you, oh, the art speaks for itself. So God, the grand artist of them all, who creates beauty, speaks loudly through this beautiful creation that he's made. And the question the psalmist wants to know is, what do you hear? What words do you hear? I mean, you, isn't it true? Aren't there some days when you wake up and you come into the beauty of a day, even in the spring, and you may not be in Oklahoma, but you say, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. No, I'm not going to do that. Right? I mean, isn't that true? And for me, I must tell you, by the way, I'm convinced that my or your, our internal thermostat was set by God in light of the place where you were born. I was born in Southern California. The cold is, is completely foreign to me. I'd rather sweat than freeze any day. And some of you strange people who have some sort of strange idea that the winter is a good thing, a pox of plagues be on you. I mean, I, I just, I, uh, my goodness, isn't, and, and the psalmist talks about the sun kissing the bridal earth with its heat, and there's not a corner that does not enjoy the, the kiss of the bridegroom, this beautiful sun that courses through the heavens, and it, and it just, you feel it's hit, and that's me, I, on a summer day, I don't care how hot it is, it's a good day. But God, for some reason, made me suffer in the wilderness of Missouri. For many years, they have this unspeakable season called winter. Snow, cold. (laughs) I just shiver thinking about it. Thank you, Lord, you brought us to Arkansas. Thank you so much. I mean, we all get a little sliver of it, right? But isn't it true that when the grass begins to, you know, turn green and the flowers begin to burst first, aren't you celebrating like I am? I'm so glad. It's about to get beautiful. But I have to confess, after like a foot of snow would fall, and I'd walk out into the snow, and I would see in the stillness of that moment the sun shining brilliantly and the snow reflecting like diamonds, the trees covered with ice, and the sun piercing it, coming out as if the radiant glory was coming from the inside out, almost as if it were a glimpse of the resurrection, where the glory of God shines from within forever. And I have to tell you, even (laughs) this warm-hearted man, (laughs) uh, at that moment I would hear the voice of God. As a matter of fact, the psalmist basically understands that, like, like any artist, you, what do you hear God saying to you? 
What does beauty sound like to you? Does it like Oscar Wilde? Does it mock you because your life is not what you hoped it would be? Or does beauty inspire you knowing that you indeed could be the embodiment of what beauty is? The psalmist says in verse 4, their line, this, this kind of wordless word that comes throughout all creation, he, he says their line has gone out through all the earth. And it's a vague expression in Hebrew. It's hard to understand what it meant. And Paul will quote this line later. And so the Greek translation of the Hebrew actually helps us. The word that Paul uses and, and that the Septuagint uses is actually the tone of voice comes shouting through. And what is God's tone? When you greet the day, the created world, what is his tone? I think beauty has got to have a, an incredibly inspiring, hospitable, marvelous tone. Well, our psalmist compares his tone as the sun moves from one side of the earth to the other, moves like a bridegroom. And I know that doesn't mean much to us because in the West, the center of the celebration, the, the point that means everything is the bride. Right? I mean, the bride is the center of attention, and we're all waiting for the bride to come down in the Western, and we all are, are admiring her beauty. But that's not the way it is in the East. In the Eastern culture, the main event is the groom. And can you imagine what it would be like if, if we decided to basically conduct our weddings like Easterners do? Right? Because the way he sees the sun moving is like a bridegroom. Can you imagine? The bride is here waiting. I, can, I have the whole thing in my head, actually. She says, Romeo, Romeo. Where art thou, Romeo? And he comes busting through the doors and like Aladdin, you know, before the parade. Strutting down the aisle like Mick Jagger, you know, doing the, the rooster strut. And as he comes down the aisle, oh, what a beautiful morning. I've got a beautiful feeling. And the whole crowd, we go, oh, oh isn't he marvelous? We could have started a trend. You're looking at me like, that'll never fly. <laughs> yeah, here's one of, the, one of the big problems is the male ego. <laughs> Think about it. It would be so inflated. A guy may get inside the room, but he wouldn't be able to leave. His head would be so big. This is the picture of creation. Think about it. The sun courses like a bridegroom in resplendent glory. It shouts out of the creator his power and majesty, every day, day to day. And I know we typically think of the work of God as that which is miraculous, the unusual, the phenomenal, and we're all looking for God to do something, and there's nothing wrong with that because sometimes he shows up in marvelous ways. But think about this. The psalmist works with the presumption that the miracle of life itself is a daily gift that should remind all of us that God is a generous God. Every day. Day to day pours forth speech. Every day. He's reliable. Think about a reliable miracle, a reliable glory. Every day. Seamlessly, therefore, the psalmist moves in verse 6 to verse 7, making the assumption that after you take in the beauty of creation and is marvelous and glorious and wonderful and powerful, then you will therefore say, 
I want to know the Creator. The general revelation of God that He's given to all people should incite the heart and say, I want to know that artist. I really do. Do you hear it? He makes that assumption. Because immediately he goes to the law of the Lord is perfect. Speaking of the word of God. The commandments of of the Lord are pure. The testimony is indeed sure and marvelous. But here's the thing. As a Gentile, I have to tell you, when I read the law of Moses, this law that was given to Israel, and it shouldn't surprise us the psalmist talks like this. The psalmist talks like a Jew. Of course, once you see God's creation, Genesis 1 and 2, then you, of course, you also know he gives commandments, he gives directives, he gives particular revelation of who he is and what he looks for in us. So in this work of God, In this law of God, in the commandments of God, to him, to a Jew, this particular revelation, all the wisdom you find in the Scriptures, it's like sweet. It's sweet as honey to your mouth. But I have to tell you, as a Gentile, and maybe I shouldn't confess this, some of the laws of Moses, some of the Torah, is not really all that sweet to my mouth. In fact, at times, it's like a bitter pill to swallow. You know, go slaughter all the Canaanites. Don't eat this food. Dress only like this. Can't do these things on Sabbath. I mean, there's 613 commandments. And perhaps I can make the right assumption. You share that. Probably most of us are a bunch of Gentiles in this room. We don't keep all of the law. There are commandments that I read that don't sound all that beautiful. The law of God is not all that perfect to me. So what are we to do? Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, gives us the answer. And that he quotes in Romans 10, that line from Psalm 19. Paul's throughout chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's trying to explain why the gospel is good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for for Jews as well as Gentiles. And basically, he says this in chapter 10. We're going to skip around. He says this, verse 4, Christ is the end of the law. And that word end is telos. It means goal. It means the end, the fulfillment. In other words, Paul works with this assumption that the law is a tutor that leads people to Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Put it like this. The Word of God became flesh. And for Gentiles, since Christ is the end of the law, he's the embodiment of the law. Therefore, when I go back and read what the psalmist says about Psalm 19, about the law of Moses, I think, oh my goodness, if Christ is the end of the law, then when I read the, the law of the Lord is pure and simple, I go, that's right. The law, or his law is perfect. What was Jesus' law? Do unto others as you would have them do to you. The commandment of the Lord is desirable, he says. Yeah, because his commandment to us is love one another as I've loved you. See what I'm saying? If Christ is the fulfillment of the law, indeed his life, his teaching is desirable as sweet as honey. As a matter of fact, we sing choruses like that. As we speak of Christ, we use the language of the psalmist in Psalm 19 because Christ indeed is the Lord of all. Just as creation shouts out the glory of God for all, so Christ is the Lord of all. That's why Paul will say in verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. He's the Lord of all. That's why verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And yet there's a problem. Although we easily go from the works of God to the Word of God, and we see seamlessly the connection, 
God shouts in creation, and then we see Christ in his full glory, and we see everything we want in humanity and for ourselves. There's a problem. Why doesn't everyone believe? That's what Paul says. Read with me, would you? Verse 14. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How will they b- believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, and now Paul quotes Isaiah, and he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who, and re- what he literally writes is, the, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, the gospel, the good tidings. Verse 16, however, they didn't all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So Paul says this, faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Then he quotes this line from Psalm 19, verse 4. Their voice has gone into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Paul sees the good news of Jesus Christ is evident. Not only in a glorious God who's generous and created all things, but that we indeed are meant to be a people who reveal his glory too. And the only way that we can do that is because Christ, the Word of God, became flesh, the incarnation of the very glory of God. He is indeed everything that is desirable. He's everything that's sweet like honey, like the honeycomb. Indeed, His commandments are so desirable. He lived a beautiful life, and so we can see beauty in person as good news. For who he is is who we are meant to be. Hear me. Everyone listen to me now. All you got to do is go outside and see the beauty. That's all you got to do. Therefore, tomorrow, when the bridegroom is making his way through the heavens, And in the middle of the day, he decides to go in his tent, check his hair, maybe. Here's the question I'm asking. What do you hear God say? The ancients, when they saw the sun darken, like in the days of Egypt, or in the days of Christ's crucifixion, they saw it as an omen of judgment. But because Christ has come and conquered death, tomorrow, when the heavens declare the glory of God and the sun is eclipsed for a moment, I will see that he is not only our rock, but he is our redeemer. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us by the glory of what you've made through your works, but especially through your word. Paul says, has the gospel gone forth? Yes, it has. The gospel is evident in Jesus Christ, embodied in your church even to this day. We can see the beauty of all that you've made, the incarnation of the gospel in each one of us. Help us to be an artistic expression of this beautiful art of your hand, a word that is powerful, that makes life worth living. Lord Jesus, you do. So I pray that tomorrow when we lift our eyes to the heavens, we'll remember the bridegroom who comes in glory and will finish what he started on the last day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand your feet? We're going to sing a song of response. I'll be at the front to receive any who come forward. Let's sing together.
Uh, as many of you came prepared to give an offering, just know that when you give an offering, it helps create environments that people like Bryce can respond to the Gospels. Bryce, we're grateful for you and your life and your family being here and celebrating a new life in Christ. And it's always a great thing to be able to do that. So you've come prepared. We have offering boxes in the back. We have opportunities to give digitally. We'd love for you to be able to exercise that and use that because that is a way of worship and it's an opportunity to give back unto the Lord. Colt has one last thing to say before we leave and uh, tell us a little bit what's going to happen this afternoon for those that might be interested. Yes, so um, we are bringing handbells back. All right, yeah. So uh, we have, uh, hand, if you're interested, handbells will be meeting in the choir room, which is kind of on your way to the sanctuary on this hallway here. We're going to meet there, and then we'll end up going upstairs to where the handbell room is. But this will be led by Kathy Williford. Um, she's a dedicated choir member. But also, you've probably seen her in the um, preschool. preschool. Preschool, thank you. The preschool, she works the desk uh, quite often. In any case, um, if you're interested in handbells or were curious what it's like to play them, um, you're under great direction from Kathy Williford, but I invite you to come at 5 o'clock in the choir room today. All right. Thanks, guys. You are dismissed.